Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. In case you haven't noticed, the YouTube versions of each episode are the ones that premiere first now on Friday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, and the podcast versions of each new episode don't premiere until the following Wednesday. So if you want to catch episodes as soon as you can after they come out, YouTube is your best option for that. Tonight's guest is Kyle Ross. Kyle, welcome to the show. Hi Vic, how are you? I'm doing great, and you? I'm doing good. Good. Well, thanks so much for being here. Kyle, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Sure. My name is Kyle Ross. I live in a small little town outside of Ponca City, which is north central Oklahoma. I have been all around Oklahoma, moving different spots, going to school and things like that, and finally moved back home a few years ago and help my dad start a business. I've lived in the woods my entire life, had no crazy experiences until I was about 15. And every time I go into the woods, I have to take a double take now, which if you're in a little town and that happens, everybody seems to know that you're scared of the woods. And that is not a good thing to have. Well, after what happened to you that one night when you were 15, I could definitely understand you wanting to take that double take. But we'll get into what happened that night later on. After we had that first conversation, something very interesting happened. What did happen? I got off the phone with you and was just kind of going about my normal routine, kind of picking up stuff around the house and watching a little bit of TV. And out of nowhere, my little Boston Terrier, Bailey, started going absolutely crazy. And she's never done that before. She'll bark if you walk up on her and startle her a little bit. But she has never gone, her hair was raised on her back. She was barking uncontrollably. And at first I thought maybe she's seeing a reflection in the window or maybe me moving back and forth. She's seeing my reflection. So I kind of grab onto her and pick her up to show her that it was a reflection. And as I walk up to the window, I kind of see a black outline. I mean, it was darker than it was dark outside, and I've never seen that before. And about that time, I see yellow. I I start to make out yellow in the window, and it kind of took me off guard. I kind of looked behind me to see if it was my lamp or if it was some sort of light reflecting from somewhere. I couldn't find it, and then I turned back really quick, and I just see these amber-yellow eyes just staring at me. I think once it realized that I knew it was there, it bolted. I had never been that terrified in my entire life. It, It was like... The eyes were looking just straight through me, like it was trying to (laughs) take me, is what it felt like. And my dog was still growling and barking, and I put her down, and I kind of stepped away from the window, almost reeling back from it, and just total shock of what I had just witnessed. At first, I thought, okay, I don't believe in coincidences. How did it know? How how did it know that I had finally opened up about my experiences and and is this common and almost gave like a supernatural element to it and I don't know if that's the case or not but definitely from that experience it felt like it because it, it was too too much of a coincidence to just happen randomly and what I do remember is when I saw it. It had one arm up, almost like when you grab onto something above you and you're getting ready to pull yourself up. That's kind of the motion it made. And then when I made the eye contact, 
and it realized that I was looking at it, or maybe it knew the entire time, I don't know. But as soon as I kind of realized what I was seeing, the outline with the eyes and the ears, and I didn't see any snout. It was just it was just a solid black mass with huge ears, with one arm up, and then it saw, it dropped its arm, and then it booked it. Part of me wanted to go outside and look if I could see where it went, but the other part of me was saying, don't. Don't even do that. That's that's risking. That could be something bad. And my body was just screaming at me. Don't look. Do not go and find out where that thing went. Because whatever that was, it had bad intentions. And even talking now, just kind of flashing back to it, I'm kind of shaky and, and nervous because I've never had anything like that happen to me before. And that is something that shouldn't be there. And that, if it wasn't for my dog barking, who knows what would have happened. Maybe it was just looking, or maybe it was trying to figure out a way in my house. I don't know. But I'm glad I'm still here, and I'm talking to you about it, because that was scary. That that was sheer terror, is what I felt. Oh, I can understand. How far do you live from the closest woods, Kyle? I would say the closest woods is probably a quarter mile, if that. The way our town is, is we're between two major highways, and a river cuts through right there. And it, and in some parts of our town, the river cuts really close, and then another part, you know, it cuts way away. So where I live, It's about a quarter of a mile, and that's a rough estimate. I don't know exactly how far, but it's pretty close. Yeah, that is pretty close. To get to the woods that are roughly a quarter mile away, are the houses fairly widely spaced, or would it be kind of hard for it to make it to those woods without being seen because of it being a pretty tightly grouped clutch of houses? My small town, the houses are pretty spread apart. I mean... Some houses are closer than others, but from where I am to the woods, it's literally a straight shot down a barely used road. That's just one of many ways to get there. You could walk there and get there in less than 10 minutes, and you could go in between houses, and nobody would even know you're there. A lot of people around here work for the oil field or work for Conoco, which is in Ponca City, and so they have crazy shifts around here. So there's a lot of times that people won't be home at night or during the day, and it's just kind of sporadic on who's home at night and who isn't. And so you could, I I can't tell you how many times as a kid I would sneak out of my parents' house and walk to the woods, and nobody would even know that I went into the woods. That's just how oblivious people are, really, of the outside, because it's a pretty tight-knit community. Everybody knows everybody, so it's not really high alert. It's just laid back. Everybody's here. Everybody knows each other, and it's, it's quite easy to get straight in the middle of town to the woods, and you could literally do it without anybody noticing you. And that's just how it is, and that's how it's always been, until I saw what I saw. And now every time I go outside, I'm constantly looking over my shoulder, hoping that I don't see it again. Well, I can definitely understand you being so weary after what you've been through. Did you hear about anyone else in your neighborhood seeing it that night? No, and, you know, that goes back into one of the bad things about a small town. Everybody knows everybody, and so if you come out and you say you've seen a dog man, people are going to, they won't really say anything negative to your face, but we have old men that sit in the coffee shop and gossip, (laughs) you know, that's what they do, and so if you come out and you say, hey, I've seen something I can't explain, this is what it was, they may, to your face, say, oh, yeah, well, that's interesting, and then go to the coffee shop and (laughs) 
say, you know, did you hear about that crazy Roth boy? You know, he, he said he's seen something. So it's not really talked about. There probably is more people in this town that may have seen it, but will never say they have. Just because it is a small town and everybody knows everybody and it's just that way. It's always been that way. So if somebody does something, everybody knows about it. I understand, but it still is a shame it's got to be that way. Yes, yes, it, it is. It's really sad because who knows what you could learn. Experiences like that, is there more people? My thought is children out at night, is there a way that we could kind of know when there's a higher influx of these things, you know, to keep kids inside? Because that is scary to me, that these kids are out at night and these things are out there that could take them in a heartbeat, and there's nothing they could do about it. And if some people would just talk about it, maybe we could learn more to keep kids safe. Oh, I agree. You found that out the hard way 15 years ago, though. Yes. Yes, I did. You sure did. Did you hear any noises when you saw the dog man outside the window that night? No, and that was probably the spookiest thing about it. I was completely oblivious to it, and I would have never known it was there if it wasn't for my dog. That that was what was weird. When it, when it ran, it's almost like it, it knew how to not make noise if it was running. It was just quiet. It was just a solid movement, and it was gone, and no noise, no nothing. Just absolute silence. And that was incredibly eerie. I've never heard an animal run that fast and not make a noise. And, you know, I've been out in the woods. I know when deer run, they make noise. When squirrels run, they make noises. Rabbits, as small as they are, they run. You hear them. But this thing was just quiet. Nothing. It just, whoosh, gone. Where this happened in Oklahoma this time of year, it had to be pretty warm. I know it was nighttime, but was the window open to help cool the house, or did you have the AC running and the window closed? Well, that's what really took me back, was that night, for whatever reason, they were closed. I normally, because right now in Oklahoma, you know, it's really nice at night. I normally have all my windows open and let the air come in, you know, get fresh air. But that night, they were closed. And that's why it hit me that maybe my dog was seeing her reflection. So I thought, okay, well, she she must not be used to her reflection because she's still a young puppy. So whenever I looked, I saw her looking up. And I thought, okay, I have the windows closed. She's looking at a reflection. She's just barking at a reflection or me walking back and forth. And they were closed. And normally, they would have been open. And to be completely honest with you, thank God they weren't open. Because no telling if that thing would have came in or not. And if it would have came in, there wasn't anything I could have done about it. It was just so massive. And for whatever reason, they were closed. And I can't give you an explanation to why they were closed. They just were that night. No idea why. Did you find any footprints outside that window the next day, or did you look for any? No, and I was so disappointed because I am all about physical proof. I went outside, and I looked, and I looked. We had a light rain, so it was a little... It it wasn't muddy, but the ground was damp. But When I went out and I was looking for footprints, in between where the window that it was in is where I normally have my boat parked, but it was pulled out because it was getting worked on. And it's a little area that's about, I would say, six, seven foot across and about 15 foot deep. And so where it was, was inside my privacy fence area. It doesn't have a roof on it. It's it's open, but it's got two sides of privacy fence. So when I went in there, I was hoping that I could find a footprint to send you, actually, because I told you about that because it really shook me up, and I was looking everywhere. But what I did find 
was where I don't know what kind of grass it's called. It's like a a, a long stem of grass. It's it, I think it's actually a weed, but it's got a diamond tip on it. And when I looked in there for the footprints, I noticed there was one patch of that grass that had been knocked over like something had stepped on it. And whenever you grow up in the woods and you, you're you hunting, you have to kind of look for those kind of things whenever you lose blood trails. And so when I noticed that, I really focused in on that area trying to find footprints around it. But there was absolutely nothing. It, it's like it knew not to step on the dirt, but to step on the grass. And whether that was by chance or whether it knew that, I don't know. But the grass was knocked down and there was definitely something standing right there. And it had to have been something heavy because it broke off at the base of it. So that to me shows a level of intelligence that quite frankly is terrifying. You know, if it knows not to leave as less amount of evidence as possible so you can't track it, that is scary. That is way too smart and that should not be. Oh, I agree. Looking the way they do, being as intelligent as they are, just doesn't get any worse than that. Who else was home when this happened? I was actually home by myself. My wife works at night for a nursing home. And so I I happened to be home that night by myself. I don't get spooked easy. I just was watching TV, doing my normal routine, was actually kind of excited after I talked to you to get that off my chest finally, what my experiences were. And so it wasn't like I was sitting there huddled in a corner, scared about it. That wasn't the case, which you can explain later on with my first encounter, which is why I didn't feel that way. So I wasn't psyching myself out or anything like that. It was just a normal night. I was cleaning up. I was just doing my own business, you know, and just not scared, not even thinking to be looking out the windows. It was just a typical night. And so I was by myself. I wish I wasn't because it's always better when you have two people see it. But at the same time, I'm glad she wasn't home to see that because she's never seen one and I don't want her to. It's not worth showing that they exist to terrify somebody like that. To me, it's not worth it. You know, I would much rather her be blissfully unaware than see it and be terrified to go outside. I don't want that for her. So in a sense, I'm glad I was home by myself. But on the other hand, I wish somebody else was there to see it. Because you do, I mean seeing it even more than once, you still think you're you're losing your mind seeing these things because everything in your head is telling you that should not be there. That should not exist. And yet it does. And so, yeah, I was, you know, like I said, I was, I was by myself, but honestly, I'm thankful that I was. Well, that says a lot about your character, the fact that you're so other-directed is to be glad that your wife wasn't there when you had that experience. I'm really impressed. Well, thanks. I try. That's part of the reason why I'm giving this interview is hopefully to, in a way, help people, but then also hopefully bring awareness to this because it's there. It is out there. And I don't care how many people come up and say you're seeing things or, oh, that's just a figment of your imagination, whatever. And no, it's there. It's a it's a thing. It is a physical thing that exists and it's terrifying. So it took me <laughs> forever to to tell anybody about it. Now that I have, part of me hopes that somebody listening will step forward and give their account. So maybe we can figure out what these things are exactly. Well, I'm so glad you are coming forward and talking about your experiences. It definitely does help. After you had that recent encounter with the dogman at the window, you told your dad about your experiences with them. He had a strange response to you letting him know about them. What was his response? 
Well, to kind of give you a little bit of a background on how my dad is, he is a very stern individual, not in a mean way. He's just very quiet, and when he says something, he means it. So he's hunted his whole life. He he taught me everything I know, and when I told him, he was the hardest to tell, to be quite honest with you. It, it was... It was the most nervous I've been telling somebody something I think I have ever been because I respect my dad so much. And so when I approached him about it, the first thing I said was, hey, I had this encounter. What do you think? And he said just a very simple sentence. He said, well, there's things out there that you just can't explain. And there's big things out there that shouldn't exist. And that was it. <laughs> That's what he told me. So whether he has seen them or not, I don't know. But judging by what he said, he's seen something. He just doesn't talk about it. To me, it's it's kind of bugging me because I want to know if he's seen these things. But at the same time, he is that kind of individual to where he said that, leave it alone. Don't push it or... He may shut down, or he may actually say something. So there's no in-between there. Having him answer you that way, that sure does raise more questions than answer questions you might have had. Yeah, absolutely, because usually when he answers me, it's exactly what my question was. That was completely opposite of his normal demeanor. You could kind of tell when I asked him that, it kind of took him off guard. But he's so hard to read. It, I don't know how off guard it was. And then he said it and continued to watch TV like nothing had happened. So I got up and I left. So, yeah, more questions than answers for sure. That is a pretty strange way to answer your question. It sure does make you wonder what he might know about them or what he might have experienced. But I guess we'll never know. Hopefully one day he'll tell me, but I don't know. <laughs> he's just that kind of person. Yeah, time will tell. How important is it to you to get the word out about dogmen being real now? Like I said, it's one of those things to where it's very important to me, first of all, because these things are out there. You can find evidence of it. All these eyewitnesses can't be just seeing nothing. You know what I mean? It's just so... It's an area that we need to figure out what is going on there. Because if there is a predator like these out there, we need to be aware. I know they're out there. But other people who don't kind of go blissfully into the woods and may not even know that they're being stalked. How many cases has there been of missing hunters? How many of those are dogmen. Maybe they just got lost in the woods, or maybe there was a predator out there that got them. To me, that's enough of a question that needs to be answered. So that's why I finally came out and told somebody about it, because this is something we need to find out what they are, because there's more research into Sasquatch and Bigfoot than there is in this. I think just because People can kind of at least understand Bigfoot to where these things shouldn't exist. They, they should not be anywhere but in a movie. But yet, here they are. They are here. And so, I, to me, it's very important getting the word out. And not so much warning people in the sense that, hey, don't go out in the woods ever again. But get it out so people are aware out in the woods that these things are out there. It's just like bear. People know bear are out there, but they still go hunting. I don't know how similar they are to bears, but at least knowing that something's out there can kind of prepare you for it when you go hunting or when you go hiking or whatever, I think it needs to be studied more so we can understand them because they are terrifying. They shouldn't exist. 
and they do, so we need to figure them out. Yeah, they definitely have a monopoly on the word terrifying. There's no arguing on that point. Yes, they do. They are terrifying, absolutely. Yes, they are. All right, Kyle, let's talk about this encounter you had about 15 years ago. Please give us every last detail that comes to mind. Sure. One day I was out. It was about summertime. It might have been early summer because we weren't in school. I don't remember the exact date, but I was outside with a friend of mine, and he didn't tell me that I could release his name, so I'll just refer to him as my friend. So we were outside. We were talking. He lived across the street from my parents' house. And so it was kind of getting late, so he had to go home. Well, we were outside, and he kind of turned. He couldn't even get words out. You know, he turned, and he just kind of, his eyes got huge. I mean, huge. And I kind of saw that, and I thought, well, that's weird, you know. And so I turn, and I see this shadow at first. I just see kind of a head and then it kind of comes out going west and it's slowly walking but it's crouched kind of like a cat when it's stalking but it's got its nose straight down to the ground like it's smelling something. I see it walk and the first thing that comes to my mind was that's not a dog that is huge. And I kind of just freeze, like, what on earth am I looking at? I can't explain it. And it just kind of, it doesn't trot like a dog. It it glides, almost like a cat. But it was canine. It was all canine. You know, you you could see the big muzzle, you know, the big pointed ears, the big tail, uh, fluffy tail. The thing about that is we don't have bear. In my area, we don't have wolves in my area. No big predators other than coyotes. And I've seen coyotes. I've seen coyotes my entire life. And they don't get that big. This thing was massive. I mean, absolutely massive. And I just remember thinking to myself, am I seeing things? Is this real? Surely somebody's playing a prank on us or or something, your mind is just racing on, what is this? I was quite a ways away from it. I, You know, about a block and a half is where my parents' house is from the corner, and it's actually on the corner of the church, the Catholic church we have here in town. And they have a light by the front door of the church, and that's the light that it was going under. And so... As it's walking, it's just so feline as far as movement is concerned, but so canine looking. It's very bizarre. And like I said, I knew it wasn't a coyote. I knew it wasn't a wolf. I knew it wasn't a bear. And I knew it wasn't a mountain lion because it had none of their features. I know what bear looked like as a kid. My dad and I and my uncles would go up into Colorado and hunt. So I know what bear look like. I know what mountain lions look like because they're around here and I've seen them. This thing looked nothing like any of those. And it's so shocking, but yet some part of me was so curious to figure out what this thing is. And that, That was, I guess I could say I'm a bit fortunate up until my last encounter that I was more curious by it than I was scared by it. And I wanted to figure out what this thing was. And I hear stories on your show all the time about people's first encounters and how terrified they are. I wasn't terrified. I was scared because I didn't understand what I was looking at. But I wasn't terrified. And so part of me really wanted to explain what this thing was that I was looking at. And I didn't know about dogmen or 
anything supernatural at that point. And watching it, I was just so fascinated by it. This thing should not be in our area. I know it's not a bear. I know it's none of those things. But it's right in front of me, and it could be something unknown. I was curious. I I was curious. I was not. I was scared, but I wasn't terrified. But more curious than anything. And I just remember looking to my friend after a few minutes had gone by, and it, it was heading straight into town. I mean, straight into town because the road it was following goes right to downtown. And of course, it, it's a small town, so it's kind of a ghost town up there. Once five o'clock hits, everybody goes home and there's no businesses open downtown. And so it was heading that way. But, you know, after it kind of walked into the shadow, I I lost track of it. It was going towards downtown, and I looked to my friend, and I said, did you just see what I saw? And he said, yeah, it looked like a huge wolf. And I said, that's exactly what I thought, because he knew what coyotes look like, too. He turned to me and just, was in shock, I think. And he said, okay, I'm going to go home because whatever that thing is, I don't know if it's still around here. I'm going to go inside. And he went inside. And what I did, I don't recommend doing this at all, but what I remember doing is being so captivated by it that I walked up onto my porch by my front door hoping it would walk back. And I stood there for maybe another 10, 15 minutes, hoping I could see it again. And I never did. And it was late. I didn't want to get grounded for being out too late or anything like that. So I went ahead and went inside and didn't tell anybody about it other than my friend. We kept that secret for, God, 15 plus years, a long time. And he still doesn't like to talk about it. I broached him on the subject not too long ago because I was thinking back on all this before I spoke to you, Vic. I was watching your show, and so I called him and asked him if he remembered it, and he's actually Native American. And so I asked him about his tribe and legends on him to see if anything even like that existed in legends for him. And he said, not that he knows of, but he's not really big into their ancient culture as far as, like, stories that were passed down. He knows just enough to where he kind of feels comfortable with it. But I asked him, I said, do you remember that night? And he said, yes, I I remember it. And I said, well, tell me what you remember about it. And all he said was, I remember it was terrifying. And he was terrified by it. But it didn't strike me the same way. And so I asked him if he wanted to talk about it, and he said no. So he remembers it, but he still won't talk about it. So it it definitely hit him harder than it ever did me. So I I can't explain it. it. It's one of those things, as time went on, I thought, maybe I shouldn't tell anybody because it sounds crazy. Nobody's going to believe me, that sort of stuff. And then I happened across your channel, and then I kind of built up the confidence to talk to you about it. And so after I did, you helped out a lot as far as getting it off my chest and wanting to make other people aware just because it had been so long and thinking that you're insane for all those years and then finally hear other people talk about it. It was a relief to finally tell somebody and they believe you and and that is probably what was the hardest thing for me to swallow was telling people and that they may not believe me that was harder than the experience at that time because I I wasn't terrified I you know like I said more curious than anything so telling people what I saw was harder than the experience itself. And I wonder if that is the case for a lot of people. If them telling somebody is just as traumatic as the incident itself. 
Oh, sure, for a lot of eyewitnesses it is. But after having done that, for almost all of them to a person, they feel so much better. Yes, and and it is. It's a huge relief. And I have to thank you personally. Whenever I talked to you that first time, you gave me an analogy about a highway. And people <laughs> living in, in tribes in the Amazon, they don't know what highways are, but you telling them they're a real thing doesn't make it any less true. And to me, I've kind of kept that in my head and I've told important people to me about my incident, not really caring about the, re- not, not so much not caring, that's not the word, but less concerned about the repercussions. And, and so far, you know, everybody I've told, they believe me because they know I'm not the kind of person to make up wild stories to get attention. I'm just not that kind of person. And that's my dad in me. He doesn't tell stories to get attention. And it, it was so relieving telling people you care about that this happened. And whether they believe it or not, their support is still there. And I think that's important for people to move forward is to know, even if you tell somebody and they don't believe you, but as long as they support you, that's good enough. And there are people out there that will listen and know that what you've gone through and have gone through the same thing and do believe you, and you have their support as well. And that, to me, was a huge realization. You know, I didn't realize that they were as common as they were. Unfortunately, they are. And you make some really good points about talking about experiences. It might not seem like it at the time, but almost every time you talk about an encounter that you've had with one of these things, you will grow from that and benefit as a result. Absolutely. I believe that 100%. It may be terrifying, but having support will help you cope through it. Oh, sure. It might not seem that way at the time, but I really do believe that's how it is. When you first saw that dog man in the street, how far was it from you in feet? I would have to say probably 500 feet, maybe, max. In, in between probably four and 500 feet, I would say, roughly. I think one of the reasons why it was so easy for you to get over that first encounter you had 15 years ago was because of the distance between you and that dog man. If you would have had this most recent encounter back then where it was so close, I think it would have been a lot harder for you to get over. Absolutely. Whenever I talked to you, I was still more curious than anything. But after seeing what I saw in the window and that, I don't want to say murderous intent, but you can tell it's not good intent, that changed everything for me. It was a completely different feeling than the first time. And I will never forget the first time how I felt compared to what I felt when I saw it in the window. They're night and day differences. Well, I can understand that. With regards to size, how did that first dog man compare to the one that you saw recently at the window? They were, I mean, I would say they were roughly the same height. The one down the street, I would say it was on all fours. The one in the window was kind of crouching a little bit. I don't know how to explain how it was crouching. Almost like, this is going to sound really nerdy of me, but almost kind of how Spider-Man sits on some of the comics, you know, where his hands are in between his legs almost with his legs out. It was almost like that, other than one hand was up, almost like it was getting ready to jump. The outline of the leg, no, I couldn't see the whole leg, but it was the top part of the knee, and the way it was setting was almost like it was getting ready to jump with one arm up, almost like it was grabbing something to get leverage to jump. I couldn't see the feet, but it was big enough to where you could see the knees and the angle I was at, I could see it. The one down the road was on all fours, very canine-like, but walking very feline. And so 
as far as size goes, I would have to say they're about the same size. If I had to guess, even though it was kind of bent down, the one in the window was maybe six foot or seven foot, somewhere in there. I couldn't give you an exact height. The one down the road was probably about the same in length. The shoulders, I'm going to say from the bottom of its feet to the top of its shoulders on all fours, three and a half, four foot, maybe. I wouldn't even say four foot. I would say three to three and a half feet, maybe. That's rough estimate, but I would think that they were about the same size. I'll bet it was hard to estimate the size of the dogman at the window that night because of its posture, but with your Spider-Man analogy, I think I've got a pretty good idea of how it had positioned itself. Understand, if it was a canine-type dogman, they don't stand straight-legged the way a hominid like a Sasquatch or a human would, with their knees kind of angling out forward because of the hocks they have underneath them, it could kind of look like they're in a somewhat of a squatted position. So maybe that's what you were seeing that night, and that's why you described it as having kind of a spider manish appearance when it was hunkered down there looking in at you. About a year after that first experience you just told us about, you were fishing on the Salt Fork River when something interesting happened to you and some friends. Please tell us about what happened that night. Sure. I was on the river with a couple of my friends. We were catfishing. We had a couple of limb lines out. We were just having a good time, just hanging out, being kids, by a campfire, fishing, having a good time. Well, I would say we were there probably two hours, and out of nowhere, I mean absolute nowhere, we hear a scream that The only way I can explain it was a woman getting murdered is is the only logical thing that I could tell you is what it sounded like. That was freaky in and of itself. And we just kind of stopped and looked at each other like, did that really just happen? You know, what was that? And as soon as we kind of get our thoughts together, we hear something incredibly heavy hit the water. I mean, you can tell it has weight. And on the river, of course, there is mud that will come loose on the side of the river and splash. But this was a completely different sounding kind of splash. And it's hard to explain unless you've heard it before, but it sounded like something jumped in. But it was something heavy. And as soon as we heard that splash, we were all scrambling, trying to figure out what it was. And I grab a flashlight and I shine it over to where I thought the noise was. And I start scanning the water. And then another one of my friends kind of walked down the bank a little bit, not very far from us. He wanted to stay by the fire. And he was shining his light and he yells out, eyes. I didn't know what he meant by that. I said, eyes, what do you mean? And he said, eyes in the water. And he was shining his light, and I turned my light. And we see these yellow eyes, yellow amber eyes. And they were reflecting from the light, but almost like they had their own power source. I don't know how to explain it. And it's so. They they were so, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They, they stuck out of the water, and it was like they had their own power source. And they were so unique and so obvious that it, it took us all by surprise, because we, were, we have all, all of my friends that were there, we have all grown up in the woods. We knew what was out there and we've never seen anything like that and so we literally just drop all of our stuff and we hop in the truck and we recline the seats back and hide and I know that that sounds like kind of a coward thing to do but we didn't know what else to do because typically we would take 
rifles down there with us just in case. But that night we hadn't because there was something coming up that my dad didn't want us to take our rifles out there and cause a bunch of noise. So we were sitting out there, we were fishing, having a good time, thinking that we're just going to be catching fish. We're not going to need any rifles, so we didn't even bother with it. But as we were sitting in the truck, we just were praying that we had a rifle in the truck, but we didn't. And we just sat there. And I can't tell you how long we sat there, probably 30 minutes, but it felt like days. We didn't see anything. We didn't hear anything else. And we kind of slowly get up. And I think it was my friend in the passenger seat, because I was in the back seat, and he gets out and kind of looks around, jumps back in the truck and tells my other friend, we're gone. Let's get out of here. We left all of our stuff on the bank and didn't even come to get it till the next day in the middle of the afternoon. And so all that stuff was the least of our worries. The only thing we could think of was how terrified we were of something in the water that was swimming across the river and it was coming to our side of the river. So we just left our stuff there. We said, we'll worry about it in the morning. And that was terrifying. But, you know, I didn't really think too much about it until I started hearing about other encounters and how I I even heard somebody, I think on your show, talk about how sometimes they'll mimic noises. And it almost sounded like a scream for help, but it was a scream like, like they were getting murdered. That's the only way I can explain it. And as we were coming back the next day, we were looking everywhere for explanations. Maybe we heard a barn owl. Well, no, barn owls don't sound like that. Maybe we heard a coyote. No, coyotes don't make that noise. So we just kind of chalked it up to something we didn't understand, but something that was out there that we didn't understand. You know, it was scary because you don't understand. That was absolutely scary. But until recently, I haven't made the connection hearing other people's encounters about how they'll mimic children screaming or women screaming to draw you into the woods. I don't know if that's what it was doing or what the purpose was or if it was to scare the hell out of us and get out of there, which we did. <laughs> because when you hear something like that in the middle of nowhere, complete darkness, you don't mess around. You don't say, oh, whatever, it was a scary noise. Typically around here, you're armed, so you feel safe. But that night we weren't, and that noise was just, it gives me chills even today thinking about it. I've never heard that sound before or since that time. Oh, I'm sure it's a sound you're never going to forget. No, absolutely not. And like I said, I wish I could explain it better, but that's the only way I know how to explain it. When you saw those eyes out there in the water, how close were they to you and did it look like whatever owned the pair of eyes was moving or did it seem to be in the same place and static? I would say it was probably 70 yards from us, 60, 70 yards, something like that, because it was right before the bend in the river. And so it was swimming diagonal towards us. And so... Of course, obviously, we couldn't find it at first, you know, and then my friend kind of walked down a little ways and then just happened to catch the reflection in his flashlight because where it was at is kind of a bend and then it curves off real hard, but I don't know if it jumped before the bend, but the thing about it was is that the river was moving pretty quick, and so whatever was in the water had to be pretty dang strong to swim up the current towards us at a diagonal angle upstream in a river. And like I said, you know, it just had to be strong because people don't really stop and realize that when water's moving, 
it is a lot of force, and whatever it was just swam. Like, it, it didn't even, it wasn't even phased by the water. And it was probably 70 yards and probably made five, six yards towards us before we bolted. It was that fast. Ooh, yeah, that's making pretty good time. When you see eyes in the dark like that, the last thing you want to see is them moving towards you. That's awful. Yeah, it was terrifying. I couldn't really make out what it was. I just remember the eyes and the scream so vividly. I've never heard a noise like that, and I hadn't seen eyes like that before. Because even whenever I saw the dog man the very first time, I couldn't make out any kind of color in the eyes or anything. But that night on the river, seeing those eyes, the color, the color is a pretty yellow, amber color, but terrifying at the same time because you've never seen a color quite like it. But it's terrifying seeing that in the water coming towards you and that they are obvious eyes. And it's not like it was an alligator or anything. You know, there are no alligators in Oklahoma. It's way too cold for them. So that wasn't what it was. And so, but yeah, that that was absolutely terrifying. Oh, I'm sure it was. But the only thing worse than seeing a pair of spooky eyes like that in the night is seeing a pair of spooky eyes like that that are focused on you. That's horrible. Yes, yeah, and... I wasn't waiting around to see what it was or if it was trying to come after us or if it was just trying to scare us. I didn't care. I I wanted out of there. But whenever we got in the truck, the only thing we could think to do without drawing a lot of attention was to just kind of sit back in the seat and just freeze because every muscle in your body is just like, you know, you're going to stay right here until this thing passes and your brain is just racing in absolute terror. Yeah, I don't blame you guys for wanting to get out of there. About two years ago, you were in your deer stand when something strange happened. Please tell us about what happened that day. Like I said before, you know, I spend a lot of time in the woods hunting and things like that. I love to get out in nature and I I should say used to love to get out in nature and listen to birds and just kind of listen to everything around you. But this particular day, it was towards the beginning of deer season, rifle season, which is about a week long. And I was sitting there and it wasn't particularly chilly that day. I just remember kind of just sitting there comfortable. I wasn't freezing or anything. And all of a sudden, just Out of nowhere, I hear crashing through the woods. I mean, just loud, loud, loud noises. And at first, I thought that maybe it was somebody that was hunting with me out there that was making the noise. So I kind of just sat there, you know, didn't really think too much of it. Just kind of thought that it was weird. And then... It sounded like it was moving away from me, and so I figured, okay, they're going to go sit back down somewhere else and because they saw me or whatever, and then it was quiet, and then next thing I know, I hear crashing in front of me, and whenever I heard that, the first thing that I thought was, okay, that's just weird because if that was somebody hunting, they know I'm in here because they clearly turned around. And it's not like I was enclosed in anything. I was just setting up on a tree and there's no box around me. Whenever you're hunting during rifle season, you have to wear blaze orange, a vest and a hat. So I knew whatever was down there or whoever was down there saw me. Well, then I hear it in front of me and I thought that is really strange and then I noticed that it's moving fast and it's a little ways away and then I see a deer break out of the woods because where I sat in this little stand it's almost a perfect circle and there's small trees in this circle and then everywhere else around you is tall trees 
And so you don't really have any kind of uh, blocked view in this kind of circle. Well, I see the deer break through, and typically, whenever deer are spooked, they're on high alert. You know, they're running for their lives. This thing ran by me like it didn't even care that I was there. And that really took me off guard because I've seen them where they'll run and then kind of run towards you. They'll stop, notice you, and then switch directions and run a different direction away from you. Well, this thing was booking it. It ran past me, didn't even care I was there, and I'm still hearing this running, and then it stops right before the woods end. I can't see what it is. It's kind of back in the trees. But it was smart enough to know not to come out of cover like it was something that was stalking the deer, and it just stopped. And that really took me off guard because that's smart. That takes a level of intelligence that coyotes don't have. You know, they'll run and run and run and run and run. And this thing was stalking, and it stopped knowing that if it would come out of the woods, it would blow its cover. And then it was just dead silence. I mean, absolute silence. No birds, nothing. Because usually you hear squirrels in the background doing their little chirps that they do, and birds and, you know, all kinds of just nature around you. But it was silent. I mean, pure silence. And... I've never had that happen before. I sat there, and I remember grabbing my rifle and looking down the sights to where I thought I heard the noise and looking for Blaze Orange because I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe it's somebody playing a a trick on me. You have so many things running through your mind, and I'm sitting there, and I'm waiting, and it's silent. And then it's like whatever was there just kind of vanished because slowly birds started chirping again. Then you heard the squirrels running about. And that was bizarre. That has never happened to me my entire life I've been in the woods. And literally, as far back as I can remember going with my dad, the woods are alive. They constantly make noise and you hear stuff. Just It's alive. And... That silence is so weird and so off-putting because, you know, whatever is causing everything to be silent is way up the food chain compared to you because even with you walking in the woods, birds will still chirp, squirrels will still run around, and, and rabbits will run around. But whatever this thing was, everything in the woods was afraid of it. And to me... That is terrifying. Oh, sure it was. For some time now, I've wondered what's behind that whole the woods going silent thing. I just can't understand it or explain it. When all this was going on out there that day in the woods, did you smell anything unusual? Not that I can clearly remember because your brain's kind of smelling for deer and deer have a certain scent especially right around rifle season because, you know, they're running everywhere. You have bucks that are chasing doe early in rifle season and then that kind of stuff going on. So you're focused on deer. I I don't remember smelling anything that really stuck out to me. I do remember, though, seeing something weird walking in was a dead coyote that None of us had shot, and it smelled terrible, like it had been dead for a long time, but it wasn't rotted, because when an animal dies and it starts to rot, it bloats. Well, it hadn't been dead long enough to bloat, so it was a fairly fresh kill, and I remember smelling just death in the air, and then walking into the woods. I do remember that, but as far as When I was in the tree, I don't remember anything. I think I was so shocked by everything that was going on that I wasn't registering smell. I honestly have to say I I don't remember a smell. 
Well, there might not have been one, so no one could hold that against you. Did you ever hear about any of your friends having any experiences like that in that woods after you had that experience that day? No, it's mainly my family that hunts in there, and they never really say anything weird has happened, or the main thing is, is when we come back out of the woods, you know, we all meet at my grandma's, and we eat supper, and they talk about seeing a deer trail there, or finding scat here, that kind of stuff, but they never mention anything weird, so... If they seen something, they're keeping it to themselves. Yeah, that could very well be. One of them might have seen something and kept it to themselves, and we'd never know about it. Speaking of your friends, though, a friend of yours and three other guys were walking down a road in Ponca City when they had an interesting experience. What happened that day? They were actually walking on a con, I think is the name of the road. I, I know it's some kind of nut, and... It's right outside of Ponca Lake. They were walking down the road, and they had, they they said it sounded like something messing with trash cans. And so they stopped when they noticed a shadow run by really quick, and that's all they told me, that they saw a huge shadow that was way faster than any human can run, and that they heard it messing with what they thought were trash cans. You know, there's people out there that fish a lot, and they throw fish guts in the trash cans, or who knows what it was looking for. It ran, and it scared them enough to where they ran the other direction. They always thought it was Bigfoot. They thought it was Sasquatch over there in Ponca City. But after I told one of my friends this about the Dogman encounters, he said... Well, maybe that's what it was, he said, because it was fast. And they never got a good image of it, but they do remember seeing a shadow move quicker than any person can run. And they said that scared them. And to me, that's kind of a mild sighting because (laughs) you can kind of at least wrap your head around that. You know, you don't know what it was, but it ran fast and just kind of get over that, as opposed to seeing a dog man. I think they would have been a lot more terrified if it was in the light to where they got a good look at it. Since they didn't see what it was that cast that shadow, we never will know for sure what it was, but I sure hope it wasn't a dog man. You bought a timber wolf. Did you do that as a coping mechanism for having that encounter that you had 15 years ago? Or if not, why did you buy a wolf? I would say... Yes and no to a coping mechanism. Yes in the fact that I needed to figure out whatever this thing was was so different than anything I had ever seen before. But whenever I saw it, the only thing that registered in my mind was maybe it's a big wolf. Maybe that's what it was. I got him because that night kind of sent me down a path to where I wanted to figure this thing out. And so when I got him, I would try getting him quite a ways away from me and then setting down and watching how he moves. He's an all-black timber wolf, and he, he moves different. The way the light bounces off of his fur seems completely different, and he doesn't move like a feline. He moves like a canine. And after noticing that, I thought, this isn't it at all. It couldn't have been a wolf because whenever wolves move, they kind of do a trotting motion, almost kind of like a jog, even when their nose is to the ground smelling stuff. You know, I've thrown things out there, and he's had his nose down to the ground looking for it. And the way he moves is completely different. And it it just blew me away on the differences that I noticed immediately, like the lighting off his fur, because you can still, even with the uh, quite a ways away from him, with a light on him, you can tell that he's a canine. And whatever that was, 
it was almost like the fur absorbed the light so it could blend in better. It's it's way off. And after getting him and realizing that, no, it, it's completely different, it took me back to the very beginning to where, what is this? Because this isn't right. I've seen dogs, I've seen coyotes, and wolves aren't native to where I live in Oklahoma, so they can't be that. Plus, having my wolf and watching him, the way he moves, to compare to how that moved, was way different. And there are similarities as far as like features like the tail or the ears, or the muzzle. The the muzzle was a little bit shorter than what my wolves is, and it was more meatier, I guess, is, the, is how I would explain it. It was bigger, but it wasn't longer. And it was almost like you look at a wolf, you know they're designed as predators. But this thing was like looking at a super predator is the only thing I could explain. The canine features, but the way it stopped was so cat-like and smooth that it was it was like it was built for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to hunt. It was a coping mechanism because I figured once I got him and studied him, it would kind of relieve that childhood memory of finally understanding whatever it was I saw. But then realizing that it was completely different totally changed my perspective and realizing that the unknown is still out there and it is very real and it is very, very different than even a wolf. I can understand you buying him for the reasons you just explained. That does make good sense. Speaking of your wolf, where was your wolf and what was it doing when this dog man was looking in your window at you recently? Well, this will tell you how much of a guard dog he is. He was asleep. So, <laughs> and he he was on the couch dead asleep. I mean, he's really funny because he'll lay down and once he goes to sleep, it takes a whole lot to wake him up. And he's used to my little puppy kind of getting in his face and doing her little play barks and stuff like that. So he just kind of ignores her. And when she was growling and barking, he was out of it. I mean, he was asleep. And part of me wanted to scream for him to see if, I don't know, if he could somehow protect me. I don't know how to explain that feeling. But at the same time, I'm really glad that he didn't because if he did and if he tried going after it, I couldn't live with myself if something were to happen to him because of me. And that I am thankful for, that he was asleep. But he had no idea that was even going on. And after it had ran and I kind of calmed back down, I kind of shook him to wake him up and have him lay down in the floor so he can kind of keep an eye out, but after that, I didn't have any problems. So, yeah, like I said, he's, he's a great guard dog, as you can tell. So, <laughs> <laughs> I'd say so. It sure sounds to me, Kyle, like he's pretty domesticated. He is very domesticated, <laughs> and he is a big teddy bear. Yeah, it sure sounds like it. Well, it's about time to close this thing out. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah. If you're out there and you're not sure whether you should come forward or not, it's a good thing. It helped me move on and cope. It helped me understand that there is so much in this world that we don't understand. And the only way we're going to find out about it is if you come forward and talk about it. And nobody's going to think any less of you if you come out and talk about what happened to you. It honestly is a good thing, and it is the only way inside 
that you're going to feel relief because you're going to bottle it up forever and it's just going to eat you alive. And I would say, if you're going out hunting, I'm not saying don't do it, but what I'm saying is be careful. Because, again, there are things out there that we don't understand. And I hope that one day we'll be able to look back at all these interviews and have definite proof, a biological animal standing in front of us that everybody can say, that's exactly what I saw. And that is what kind of my purpose is of coming forward is, is hoping that more people will talk about it. And I think it takes a very brave person to talk about such a thing that everybody thinks shouldn't exist. And again, nobody's going to think any less of you. And it is a good thing. And there are people out there who have been through the same thing who will support you. And I'm definitely one of those people. If you ever need somebody to talk to, Vic is a great person to talk to, and he helped me out a ton. So I would say don't be scared. Be brave, and we'll figure this thing out one way or another. Very well said, and I can't tell you how glad I am to hear that our conversations did help you. That's really good news. Yes, absolutely. 100% they helped. I'm so glad they did. Well, Kyle, I can't tell you how happy I am that you came on and shared the details of these experiences with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Vic, again, for everything you've done and what you're continuing to do. It's good work. You know you're more than welcome. Well, have yourself a great night. You too, Vic. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.